Uh, today we have a uh, guest speaker, Dr. Jay Simhan. Uh, Jay is the vice chair of the Department of Urology and uh, director of Urological Trauma Reconstruction and Prosthetics at the Einstein Healthcare Network. Um, and he's associate professor of urology at Temple and Fox Chase. He's a graduate of uh, University of North Carolina. Uh, I assume that you're a Tar Heel fan. Absolutely. Uh, I'll hold that against you. And uh, he, he, uh, he trained at Temple, did a fellowship with Alan Morey in Dallas in trauma reconstruction and prosthetics. And uh, he's very well published. Uh, I heard him give a talk at the SMSNA Sexual Medicine Society meeting, and I was just telling him that, you know, a lot of times we hear talks and we hear things and we just kind of leave and don't really take anything from it. But uh, he gave a talk similar to this on kind of uh, different ways to approach uh, pain management in the uh, penile prosthetic pra practice that, uh, you know, I think really I'm going to incorporate into my practice. So I hope that uh, you'll find his talk today uh, as interesting, uh, the opioid epidemic, how we got here, and what we can do as urologists. Thank Thanks you. again. Thank you. Well, uh, I want to thank Stan. Thanks for the, thanks for the introduction. Um, thanks for the invitation, certainly. I enjoyed dinner last night with uh, some of the faculty here. And, um, you know, a lot of people uh, ask me, well, how is it that you're going to say something about the opioid epidemic? Or why is this an area of interest for you? And, you know, I, I think some of that is what I plan on trying to touch on today. And, you know, to me, again, it's an honor to be here and present it. And I, I will start with the disclaimer, fully understanding that the majority of the group here probably doesn't have the clinical practice interests that I have, which I'll go through some of those interests. But my, my hope is that in giving this type of a presentation, looking at maybe opioids and how I've related it to my practice and how I've tried to study that within my practice, try to translate this throughout urology and see if there's things that we can do within the field of urology to help advance and move the ball down the field. So um, again, we'll, we'll sort of get started and, and certainly you know, throughout, if there are any questions that you guys might have, I'm happy to, happy to answer them or near the end, of course. Um, and if you have any questions about you know, my practice too, we can certainly talk about that. We, we talked about some of that last night. Um, so the opioid crisis, it's, um, it's a problem. You know, we currently have a one, roughly one-to-one -one rate of prescriptions to Americans in this country where we are prescribing opioids at a rate that is really uh, unbelievable and it's staggering. And you know, I remember a time when motor vehicle accidents, when I was learning to drive, that's what my parents told me, that the car is what's going to kill you. And you have to you know, wear your seat belt and airbags. And you know, we've done a very good job in you know, contemporary society to update motor vehicles so that they make people safer and, and as that has decreased motor vehicle collisions and deaths from motor vehicle collisions, this is a problem that's become a staggering problem in that opioids have now become the leading cause of accidental death in this country. And um, uh, heroin overdose, opioid overdose, these are, these are significant problems in our country. And, and that started around the turn of the century. And, and that's an exponential problem. And I'll show some graphs later to show uh, what kind of problem this is and, and try to define it further. Um, you know, I think uh, many of us might see that we have patients that are taking heroin, and that's, that's really because, and it's been sort of shown through CDC statistics as well as behavioral health statistics, that really the heroin use in this country has increased because access to opioids has become more difficult, and patients that are already dependent on opioids, you know, need an alternative sort of mechanism in order to feed the, 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 feed the uh, fury, really, and that's, and that's heroin. And so uh, the natural sort of fit to this is, is, well, where exactly do I fit in into that type of a crisis? And I tell people, I'm not really a pain medicine doctor. I haven't necessarily done a pain management fellowship, but I've, I've tried to sort of see within my practice how we can make a change in pain management only because of the kinds of things that I'll, I'll talk about in, in just a few minutes. But my practice is predominantly surgical. I see uh, one day of... Uh, patients in, in our office uh, a week, and um, predominantly the rest of my time is in the operating room. We do a lot of urethroplasty, around 80 to 100 a year, around 80 to 100 penile implants a year, 20 to 30, or 30 to 40 maybe AUSs a year. 
And then, you know, the rest is basically abdominal, uh, abdominal work and very penis and hydradenitis. I call myself the bottom feeder of urology. I take what no one else wants. And so, so um, you know, that's, that's my practice. And, and when I started in practice, you know, the goal is to become busy and try to, you know, do a lot of cases and try to do, take great care of patients and try to really what I call demonstrate value, right? And, and that's really what you're trying to do, I think, when you first start out in practice is, is be a good doctor, demonstrate value. And, and for me, the academic slant, certainly in, in men's health prosthetics, as well as really male reconstruction, is a lot of the contemporary work that's being done in these fields, not all of it, but a lot of it, really focuses on technique. And, and you know, as a corollary, you look and here's some videos, we certainly do technique, you know, and, and just to say that, you know, pain management isn't the only thing that we do. And so here's some penile implant videos that talk about some of the techniques based things that we've studied. But the, the larger point here is that like robotics and like oncology, where maybe 10 to 15 to maybe 20 years ago, a lot of the thought content focused on technique. Currently in my field, a lot of the thought content focuses on technique. So people come and give a presentation of the kinds of ways you can do different cases. The top case represents, you know, an area of interest for me is, um, with, you know, I, I am the reconstructive urologist for Fox Chase and they have a big cancer population. And in the patients that are medically refractory, impotent, that undergo a prostatectomy for localized prostate cancer in the carefully selected patient, we have done con combined penile implants with a alternative reservoir placement underneath the rectus muscle and characterize that. And, and the bottom video is more of a, again, surgical how-to on how to place a difficult penile implant in a patient that was presented to me with Fournier's gangrene. And we then reconstructed his penis, skin grafted everything. And you know, a year later, he had medically refractory ED and needed a penile implant and we needed to put a penile implant in. But, but these are surgical how-to cases, and I was focused on trying to do how-to type uh, operations and advance maybe an academic field within, within my subspecialty. And what I, what I came to find, especially in the penile implant cohort, was that regardless of how happy I was in doing this type of an operation, I had significant problems with pain management in, in the follow-up period. And I would have patients that came back to see me in my office you know, two weeks later, three weeks later, so on and so forth, with tremendous amounts of pain. And, you know, I'm a bare bones uh, operation in Philadelphia. I don't have, you know, a robust support staff of two or three extenders. And, and I certainly, you know, I'm, I'm soon to be the residency director and I'm the associate director now. I certainly don't want to put it on our residents to be the people that are managing the outpatient pain issues for our patients. So it was falling on me when I had only one day of clinic and I was seeing all of these post-operative patients and the patients that needed surgery. Long story short, it was, it was very challenging. And so this became, you know, an area for me to study. And so I said, well, what's been done, you know? And one of the, one of the guys who I give a lot of credit to is a good friend of mine, and um, he's nearby, he's at Dartmouth, who has really tried to advance uh, infection prevention at the time of penile implantation, and now is probably the leading infection uh, uh, you know, sort of researcher in penile implants, along with Ricardo Moneras at Boston, is Martin Gross. So, so Martin, Martin's a good friend of mine. He's around my age. And, and I talk to Martin frequently about a lot of things. And I said to Martin, I was like, well, well, listen, you know, I know you know a lot about infection and all these things in your scientific mind. What's been done in pain, you know, for penile implants? How do you guys, how do you do it up at Dartmouth? And he was like, oh, this is great. He's like, I don't really have an answer to this. I don't know how to do this either. But Erwin Goldstein, who's the editor of Sexual Medicine Reviews, said, like, for some reason, came up to me and asked if I'd be willing to write a review article for Sex Med Reviews. He's like, give me three to six weeks. He's like, I'm working on this with my resident. My resident, who's the first author here, will be able to, you know, send you and me probably the most evidence-based strategy to managing pain in the penile implant recipient. And I was like, okay, great. I just have to wait a month. You know, I'll struggle for another month. And then I'll hear what, what Martin comes up with. And then he calls me basically a month later and he says, he's like, no, no, this is a problem. He's like, the bar is low. There isn't anything. He's like, and so if you actually go look at this paper, it's hilarious. They've, they've actually written a paper. It's like Seinfeld. It's a paper about nothing where they, they actually say that, you know, there isn't research in this area. A lot of the research sort of focuses on three days 
post-op, but not the entire delivery of care. And, and he said, well, listen, if this is an area of passion for you, he's like, you could probably do something. He's like, but I've exceeded my bandwidth. I, you know, I'm working on all these infection things. He's like, I just don't have the time. Um, but let me know, and I'm happy to help in, in if you want to collaborate in something. So I said, okay, well, the problem that we face, which I'm sure is a similar problem to what every state is now starting to face or has faced, and I heard this is happening in Connecticut as well, is we are now mandated as providers to have our patients, basically our patients are all mandatorily registered in this Department of Health Registry, and it demonstrates basically patient name, where they're getting their medications from, who's prescribing it, and, and here's the kicker, and it's law now in the state of Pennsylvania. Every time a patient is prescribed a narcotic, as the prescribing provider, you have to check the database, they will track if you check it, and you have to document that you've checked it, and if you don't, you lose your license. So that's, that's the law in the state of Pennsylvania. And that law, you know, actually was one of the major reasons signed by the governor in Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf, who won re-election because of a law that was that strict. And everyone really championed that in Pennsylvania. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm in a lot of trouble because I came up in a residency program. I trained in Philadelphia. And, and at the time, you know, the culture in the late 2000s, um, you know, in that first decade was, if they have pain, just treat it. Just give them pain medicine. And we were giving pain medicine, truthfully, to, as residents, because we would get the, do, do the residents here get outpatient phone calls? They're, are they the ones getting the outpatient? Right. So as a resident, you know, I can relate to this. So as a resident, I was getting all these outpatient phone calls, and I was doling out Percocet. And, and by, you know, year 2010, I knew I had a problem when the Percocet people came to me and said, you're one of our highest prescribers. Would you be willing to give a talk about Percocet? And they didn't know I was a resident at the time. They were like, we, we want you to be on our speaker circuit. And, and, and I was like, this is a problem. And so, so then, you know, because I wanted to be the resident to maybe avoid the phone call, and it was the prior influence of what people had told me about pain management. And I think we sort of, you know, really b ballooned out a problem here. And so I asked the question, you know, how did we really get here? And I was talking with Dr. Chai about this last night is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm big, I want to consider myself a big student of history. And so a lot of times when, especially when I have time to give a talk like this, I, I go through a, a fair amount of historical overview to look at, you know, how we ended up with this problem. And then, you know, let's go back to urology and what it means for us, what's been done in our space. Of course, my, my practice, a lot, a lot of my practice interest is in penile implants. So we'll talk some about the work that we've done in penile implants. But then uh, hopefully my goal is to relate it back to your practice and what maybe you could do in your practice or if you're a resident when you're in practice or, or when you're taking care of the patients here uh, uh, at the Yale program and, and some of the stuff that we're looking at um, um, for future work and some of the stuff that we're studying and presenting at this upcoming AUA meeting in Chicago. All right. So um, this, this does, ever, does anyone know? Does everyone know who this is or no one know who this is? Yes, Dr. Chai knows. Dr. Chai. Yes, yes. Freud. Dr. Freud, that's right. This is Dr. Freud. Sigmund Freud, mother, uh, you know, sort of a, a father of, you know, the field of psychiatry, a visionary in his own right, was, uh, you know, a busy, busy psychiatrist advancing the field as we know it today in the late 1800s. And then this is, this is a good one. You know, so this is. So the father of urology, Hugh Hampton Young, trained at Johns Hopkins. And this person trained Hugh Hampton Young. That's your clue. Halstead, there you go. So this is Dr. Halstead, who was one of the first four, right, at, at, at Hopkins. And, and the first four uh, sort of, you know, yeah, I think Osler was one of the first four. Halstead was one of the first four. Kelly uh, in OBGYN. And, and so, so basically, Halstead was one of the first four surgeons. And, you know, we have Dr. Halstead to thank for using surgical gloves. He was the one that sort of recognized antiseptic technique. And um, also a Yale grad, went to Yale for um, undergraduate studies and then um, further to Columbia and then was one of the first surgeons or first doctors at, the, at uh, Johns Hopkins and famously operated on his mother in, her, in their kitchen and removed her gallbladder between the ages of 20 to 30 and used basically 
local techniques to just remove her gallbladder, infect the gallbladder. Um, so, so Dr. Halstead and Freud are connected by one, you know, unfortunate event. They were cocaine addicts, and and you know, Halstead recognized this to be a drug that he could use for anesthetic properties, and uh, Freud recognized it sort of in the in the psychiatric patient and felt that it was really benefiting psychiatric patients. And Halstead felt that it was really benefiting for anesthesia. However, he also experimented on himself, as did Freud. And, and in that time, many people experimented on themselves in order to advance the field of medicine forward. And they both became sort of really, really big uh, cocaine addicts. And so in the late 1800s, this is a big problem. And and the first commercially available drug, I love, I love talking about this, the first commercially available drug in the late 1800s was heroin. So Bayer, Bayer, the company that made aspirin 81 milligrams, Bayer Aspirin, their actual first claim to fame was heroin, which they mass marketed, produced, was sold over the counter, and, and was purchased, you know, routinely. And, and it was supposed to be, it was intended to be a less potent form of morphine but it was in fact two times stronger. And no one really recognized that at the time that it was being marketed, but it was marketed as a cough suppressant. And, and this is the, this is, you know, this is true. This is a true story. Um, so I wanna go through just a quick abbreviated timeline of sort of where we were and, and where we are. And so in the 1800s, I said this, morphine was used as the really primary and predominant pain control agent in civil war and instances of US history. Bayer Company makes heroin. In the late 1800s is when cocaine started, but it was never marketed. Heroin was actually a marketed drug in this, in this country, and it was the first marketed drug. Um, roughly 15 to 20 years later, the government caught up and said, wait a second, you guys are selling drugs, and this is becoming you know, huge business. We should tax people off of this. So they passed a tax act, and they actually taxed the sale and production of drugs like heroin and uh, opioids. And then heroin was made illegal once a lot of people were hooked onto heroin. Um, and they, they found that it might have detrimental health side effects. And then, you know, the, the US uh, basically makes a committee on problems of drug dependence. Believe it or not, that's a committee that still exists today. And it was created in the halls of Congress to find a non-addictive painkiller. And, and they, they have survived for 90 years. They're still around. Um, um, and, and largely for 50 years, nothing gets done. So for 50 years, that nothing is really done in, in the advent of pain management, pain uh, medicine prevent, uh, pain, uh, I guess, opioid dependence prevention, until the New England Journal, which is really, you know, the, the, the highest, we were talking about impact factor yesterday, one of the highest impact factor journals in medicine that really helps drive um, a lot of the thought content. At least in our residency, we tell the residents, if there's a urology article in the New England Journal, you have to know it because that is mass media. You know, the mass media picks up on the New England Journal and, you know, patients ask you about it. So back then, the New England Journal research regarding pain medicine was published. And what is that research? This was that research. So if you look at the New England Journal, this is what people talked about was research, but it really wasn't. It was just a letter written by this gentleman, Dr. Jick. This is the letter. And this is what was said. Roughly 12,000 patients in his experience were monitored with narcotics and only four people had dependence. And so he concluded that the development of addiction is rare. And so this was a letter published in the New England Journal. It's very important. I'll, I'll say why in a sec. And then this gentleman uh, who's in New York right now, still a chief medical officer, publishes a, a journal in the uh, Journal of Pain looking at 38 patients on chronic opioid maintenance and felt published basically that it was safe. And those two articles, when you look at citations, are one of the highest cited articles in pain management ever. And right now, you know, in my, in my world of prosthetics, the Journal of Sexual Medicine, uh, the editor is Dr. Mulhall, John Mulhall, um, is actually fighting a little bit of what I would call a Twitter battle we're in the world of you know, social media. I have, a, I have a Twitter account too. And, and right now there's, there's a Twitter battle ongoing with the Journal of Sexual Medicine um, where a researcher, a basic scientist basically put out what's called a tweet storm. You guys familiar with this? A tweet storm where it's numerous tweets that follow and it's a narrative. And, and basically this person alleges that, um, 
that that public that, that this is publication fraud and it happens routinely in medicine let me give you an example and basically starts giving examples and the example is an article published in 2012 on adult circumcision in the journal of sexual medicine and then basically this person pieces pulls the whole article apart about conflicts of interest and the types of citations people were doing and the types of conclusions they were drawing from those citations. Long story short, that is happening right now in a very transparent society with social media and that did not happen in the 80s and 90s. And so back in the 80s and 90s, people were citing these works as seminal papers and seminal research to advance the concept that opioids were safe and that you don't need, uh, you can continue to take opioids and you won't cause an addiction problem. In fact, I remember when I was in medical school, that's, how, that's what I was taught, was if patients are in pain, treat it. They're not gonna be hooked on to pain medicine. Uh, and, it's, and it's been sort of studied, was what was sort of said. And, and, and my colleagues, you know, and, and maybe people can say, well, maybe that's a UNC thing. No, I think my colleagues elsewhere have also agreed and concurred that in the, you know, Late, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, that was really the dictum of, of training. So, so there's a pharmaceutical timeline here as well. Percocet and Vicodin get developed and heavily marketed. In the 80s, MS Cotton is made by Purdue Pharma. In the 90s, OxyContin is made. And then in the 2000s, when people started catching up to this problem, Purdue Pharma is sued, pays over $600 million in illegal marketing of OxyContin. These are active stories today. I actually saw this in the New York Times this week about the family of uh, Purdue Pharma that was in charge of the company, the Sackler family, apparently directed, allegedly directed efforts to mislead the public and, and new documents were found and now there's probably gonna be new litigation about this. This is uh, really from this week. And then there's, you know, that's happening on one side and then the Joint Commission basically comes and says in 2001 that we're, we should create pain as a vital sign and um, pain assessments should be done in all people. And the way pain assessments should be done is through a, a objective scoring system called the visual analog scale. The visual analog scale is really a pain score where patients might be on the 10 side if they have unbearable pain, and then on the zero side if they have no pain. But it was really encouraged that doctors and nurses alike recognize pain as a vital sign and work towards decreasing you from a 10 to a zero if you are at a 10. And you were asked as a doctor to make sure you had medications in place, uh, opioid medications in place within your order sets in order to do that. So, so, you know, I would say then that here's how we have a crisis, right? There's a lack of robust evidence-based medicine. There's pharmaceutical innovation that drives sort of, you know, maybe prescriptions. And then there's decreased regulation and increased attention to treat the pain. And then finally, there's politics. And, and what is politics? I thought this was interesting, so I include this. This is actually a JAMA level paper that was published recently in the past year or so, looking at um, political influence of those that are opioid dependent patients and showing that if you're an opioid, chronic opioid dependent patient, again, this is a JAMA paper, that they found that it correlated more with the current person in office at president. So, so the cr chronically dependent opioid patient tended to vote more for Donald Trump. And so, so um, with that said, you know, I, I, I don't know that that was actually that great of a paper, but the point though is there is a political aspect to an opioid crisis. And I imagine that this is one aspect of it. What does, what does urology do to affect change and how does this affect us? You know, I think there's a mortality, a morbidity issue, enhanced recovery protocols. How do we minimize pain without opioids? You know, the Washington Post likes to, put up sort of actuarial data looking at age adjusted death uh, per 100,000 people. And this is CDC data. And, and this is more specifically where I was. When I was learning to drive in the 90s, the problem was motor vehicle accidents and that's how people were dying. This is in the early 2000s. In 2007, the states in red represent the number one cause of accidental death being opioid related. And this is 2016 and then, and so on and so forth. Again, CDC data. So. In urology, what's been done? This is a paper that uh, was published in the Journal of Urology out of Loyola. Um, this is an HCUP analysis. Do you guys know what the HCUP uh, database is? It's basically a large uh, nation nationwide national data set looking at cost. It's a healthcare cost utilization project. It looks at cost, it looks at outcomes based on cost, and, it, it, and like any registry, it's based on ICD-9 coding. And, and so these uh, investigators looked at inpatient uh, ambulatory and emergency room 
visits after surgery, stratified the surgeries based on stone surgery, recon oncology, and basically found that one out of over a thousand patients risked dependence. The problem is, is it's, it's probably extremely underreported because the way they measure um, um, dependence was based on an ICD-9 code hospital bounce back that if you get admitted with um, opioid dependence and that's in your ICD-9 code, then they counted that as dependence. And so, you know, through that, they, they, they sort of gave an analysis saying that stone surgery puts you at the highest risk. But I call this a little bit of a red herring. It's a little bit of a distraction study because you see this type of a study and you might think that in urology, we really don't have a problem. You know, we really don't have a problem, but, but the government perceives that we do have a problem. And so there's something called the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. It was started by Barack Obama. And I talked about this yesterday and people thought I was crazy, but this is the truth. This was, this was started by uh, uh, President Obama and it was contextualized in the New England Journal editorial. I encourage you guys to look at this, this editorial. But basically there is now a push, not statewide. I was telling you what the rules are in Pennsylvania. There is now legislation for nationwide to make it such that there's a three-day opioid maximum, three days. So that means that any prescription you write, three days. And so think about the downstream sort of significant impact in urology we face with, you know, a patient that presents with stone disease to an emergency room or, uh, you know, a patient that we manage prior to surgery, elective surgery, or, you know, postoperatively. And so, so there are some unintended consequences for governmental legislation, even though, you know, a previous a previous investigation might say that, you know, we don't have a problem. The government perceives we have a problem. So why do we need, need to decrease narcotics? Because it's been shown that uh, there's a risk of acute pain control and long-term dependence without uh, decreasing it. Many opioids that are prescribed are really never taken. And the abusers of narcotics tend to come from a friend, relative, or health provider. Before I started looking at any of this, not infrequently, I would have a patient that I had prescribed narcotics to whose loved one developed an opioid addiction, basically for stealing their own medicine. And then that person would get hospitalized. It was really a travesty, you know, to, to sort of take care of patients like that. I told you that urology doesn't do a great job at looking at this specific topic. There have been people that have done a pretty good job at looking at this. In Ontario, this is an Ontario-based study where they looked at several thousand patients, a retrospective cohort study that underwent low-risk surgery. Low-risk surgery fell under four types of surgery. The one that's important to us is TERP. TERP was one of the low-risk surgeries. Lap coli was another one. Um, and basically, they categorized patients based on if they received pain medicine, when, how much they received, and then they followed it out past a year. And, and this is in opioid-naive patients. And so they basically found that you have a relative increased risk of 44% in taking an opioid at one year if you receive medication seven days following short stay surgery. Seven days following short stay surgery. And then this is a CDC report that showed an absolute risk increase of 13.5% at one year. So if you, we have patients that are taking opioids seven days following any operation, the risk that they're on opioids one year later, and this is in a naive patient cohort, patients that have not been on opioids prior to surgery. There's a 13.5% risk. So, so these are like studies that have really pushed, you know, the government to move forward in this. And in urology, you know, this is a study that's actually in press currently. I think it's a very nicely done study that, um, that I uh, reviewed. Um, um, this is out of, you know, Vanderbilt. And a Vanderbilt study that looked at less, less about sort of how much we're prescribing at the time of surgery, more about what are we doing after they leave the hospital. And you know, if you send patients with, let's say, 50 tablets or 30 tablets, what are they doing with the remaining tablets? Are they actually getting rid of the tablets? You know, is, it, is it going away? And so it's called opioid keepage following discharge. That's what they called it. And so they told patients, they tested them. They said, this is how you, are they instructed, they gave them an educational course on how to dispose of medication. And they did a pre-test or a pre-assessment and a post-test assessment. And they found that it really made no difference that still 70% of patients kept their opioids more than they should be. And um, major barriers where people really felt that um, there was a concern for disease-related pain or unrelated pain, future pain, and they just kept their medicine. And there are, there are appropriate ways to get rid of an opioid. The, the easiest way is to flush down the toilet, right? 
So, so only 10% did that. Only 10% of people roughly appropriately uh, disposed of medication. And this is a study, not that I'm holding a grudge, but this is a study uh, out of Johns Hopkins. That resident, Dr. Patel, uh, presented this at our section meeting. My resident presented some of the work we did. They won first place. We won second place. Um, um, so, so pain management certainly is you know, a hot uh, topic in the Mid-Atlantic, at least. This is a good study, though. It's a European urology article looking at um, pain management again. And they don't necessarily look at how to prescribe pain, pain medicine. What they look at is the unintended effects of what they have prescribed. So if, you, if they looked at 205 patients in the Baltimore area that were prescribed a total or a median of 225 TMEs. Do you guys know what a TME is? It's a total morphine equivalent. So oxycodone is seven and a half TMEs. Let's speak in English. 225 TMEs is 30 Percocet, all right? 30 Percocet. And what they found was on average or a median of only three Percocet were used. So even though they prescribed 30, only three were used. And this is for prostatectomy patients. And 84% use less than half the prescription. And again, only 10% roughly disposed of it appropriately. So, so to me, the problem, and, and the first study, the Vanderbilt study, is in a, a kidney stone population. So this is a, this is a prostatectomy population. And so to me, maybe the, the point is, is we, we certainly are prescribing a lot of medications. Uh, I, we were in our group, at least. And I think we need to figure out a way to maybe decrease. Maybe we're, we're just giving people too many to begin with. And, and maybe a three-day limit might be feasible in, in, in certain instances. So the way I've looked at this is I, I think hopefully I've defined the extent of a problem. And, and now how do we really treat that problem and deal with it effectively prior to, or prior to or following surgery? And like anything, what do you do? You know, urology, I think, as a field has really advanced themselves um, some because of innovation within, but some because we've been able to translate some innovation from another field into our field, whether it's laparoscopy or um, um, even many of the reconstructive things that we do, you know, we've taken from plastic surgery, I would say, tissue transfer and those sorts of things. So, so similarly, I looked at this problem and said, well, who are the doctors that treat a lot of pain? And in my mind, that's orthopedics and anesthesia. And so I spent a lot of time talking to orthopedics and anesthesia, and then they went through what I call med school 101, where they taught me about pain again. And it's pretty simple when you really sort of, this is a urologist take on pain, right? Which is pain is perceived. There are inflammatory mediators that are released, and those are your bradykinins, substance P, prostaglandins, and then those target a peripheral nervous system. And then it goes from there to the spinal cord and supraspinal centers. And then you have pain. So if you target any level of this through, uh, through numerous multimodal strategies, you'll reduce pain. And that seems fair enough, right? So what's been done in urology? What, what's been done in urology predominantly is what I would call ERAS protocols. And, and that's been done predominantly in the cancer world. And so this, again, another European urology study looking at you know, very highly cited article that, that, that is, I think, translated to practice on enhanced recovery following cystectomy. And many of these series, however, there is not one enhanced recovery series in um, cystectomy or prostatectomy, nephrectomy, that talk about pain management after discharge. They all talk about length of stay, EBL, bowel function. And, and this is no different. And, and it's actually a very elaborate study where they talk about anesthesia. You might not be able to see it here, but the middle section of this actually talks about anesthesia. And at Fox Chase, you know, we have our cystectomy pathway that we follow and we try to execute. And I've tried to, at my hospital, implement, you know, new irrigations and soaks for the types of penile implants we do, but also try to Im Im sort of import pain management strategies. And in the end, you really need sort of to work with an anesthesia colleague to figure out non-opioid-based techniques and medications to help minimize opioid need following surgery. And in the end, this is what we created, which is a multimodal analgesic pathway. It, it covers various targets. And really, as, as it's interesting to us, the targets that we focus on, because the top one, regional anesthesia, is done by an anesthesiologist, but we're in control of a lot of the rest as the surgeons. And so I'm gonna talk some about those, those topics. Um, so gabapentin, gabapentin is a medication that works centrally on GABA receptors. 
it does have an opioid sparing effect and it can be titrated up gradually. Meta-analyses have demonstrated gabapentin to cause a dramatic reduction in post-operative pain. And it's an increased, it does have an increased risk in post-operative sedation. And what I've done is I've learned, uh, we have a large rehab hospital, which, you know, they have a, a national sort of influence, Moss Rehab. And um, there are a lot of pain management PM&R doctors that I've talked with there that t talk to me about how to titrate up gabapentin. It's a great medicine to titrate up. So gabapentin's written 300 TID. There's an extended release version that you can do 300 daily. And there's another version, which is a pregabalin called Lyrica, which we might give for you know fibromyalgia type patients might get it, interstitial cystitis patients get it. But that's really a neuropathic pain medicine. And gabapentin is actually a very cheap medicine that you can, that, that most patients should be able to afford. I trade, titrate up gabapentin in doses of 300. So if it's written 300 TID, you can go to 600 TID to titrate up. And the way to do that is to start it at night. So you tell the patient to start it at night, you have your nurse call them the following day, see if they sort of experience any additional drowsiness or sedation from it. If they do, you back them back down. If they don't, which they usually don't, then you, you can maintain at 600. And you could even go up to 900. In fact, people think I'm crazy. I've gone up to 1500. The highest I've gone is 1500. In the neuropathic patient that had a history of neuropathy, we went as high as 1500. And then we titrate it back down and then they come off of it. Um, um, so that's gabapentin. Um, NSAIDs, it has an opioid sparing effect. There's an inhibition of the COX pathway, prostaglandin pathway. We all learned that in med school, I remember that. Um, it should be scheduled though, it should not be uh, as needed. And here's to me staggering, right? 600 milligrams scheduled ibuprofen is equivalent to 15 milligrams of oxycodone. That's crazy. Um, you know, and I think that's something that, you know, we could, we could probably take back in our practice. People worry about renal function. If you have renal, good normal renal function, it's ex exceedingly rare to develop post-operative renal compromise from an NSAID. The problem is if you have pre-existing renal function, then we hold it. We do hold it um, in those patients. A lot of people worry about GI issues, bleeding, G, uh, GI bleeds even, um, but also just post-operative bleeding. There's been meta-analyses, Cochrane series that have looked at this very detailed that, that's, that, that does not exist. That's a, that's a difference that has not been sort of perceived with uh, NSAIDs. Acetaminophen, Tylenol. Tylenol has been around uh, for a long, long time as an analgesic, but it also decreases nausea, vomiting, and sedation. We, we normally routinely schedule this with um, NSAIDs, and it does work synergistically. Of course, if you have liver dysfunction, you shouldn't be using it. But this is a key point. The maximum dose is actually four grams per day. You can give a lot of Tylenol. And so our dosing of Tylenol is not the standard. I think it's uh, three, what is it, 325 milligrams is that one tablet. We give actually 975 milligrams at any given dose, at any given dose of Tylenol. So now how does this get back to penile implants, right? Penile implants, at least when I started it, and, and, and Stan can say, Dr. Honig can say if I get this right, many times the conversation regarding penile implants is, oh, are you a Boston Scientific guy or are you a Coloplast guy? Which device do you use and why? And, and I just remember sort of hearing that question incessantly asked to me by the penile implant industry and thinking, well, that's just crazy. You know, we, we should really try to sort of ask maybe a different question instead of what implant do you use? The guy's impotent, he's happy. You know, the satisfaction rates for both devices are actually pretty high. Instead of focusing on maybe device things only, why don't we focus on pain issues? Because both patients, I do both devices, you know, parenthetically, I use both devices and they both have a lot of pain. And so, so uh, um, in, in follow-up. And so when you look at the penile implant literature, here's what's done. You know, it's all one day trials, penile nerve blocks, outpatient surgery, and all of these are limited by basically one to three day follow-up. They literally follow a patient for one day or three days. So uh, you know, the bar truly is low, right? That they've actually been able to get this in, in peer-reviewed publications accepted uh, you know, for publication in that they really haven't followed patients, um, but they've shown that there's pain reduction with local blockade. We created our pathway of a multimodal analgesic um, protocol to reduce opioids. And um, I think we sort of touched on some of the synergies of using validated questionnaires, not the non-validated questionnaires, and following patients for greater than one week. 
I tried to use this as a strength that we have this robust sort of monitoring program that risks losing your license. So I felt that it was, you know, it was, it was something that we could accurately capture patients. And then we, we did similar things with the VAS, and then we created our pathway. This to me is probably an important step that it took me a while to get my partners to do as well, is to actually start pain medicine before the operation in the holding area, which sounds really crazy. But the thought process, at least from anesthesia and orthopedics, is that it sensitizes those pain receptors. And so by starting it before you inflict pain, the pain of an operation, you start the medications, not that they take it before they get to the hospital, they just take it in the holding area with a small cup of water. And, and these are the doses we do, the high dose Tylenol, Gabapentin, and Meloxicam, the, the trade name for Meloxicam is Mobic. Mobic is a daily NSAID, so you don't have to do it um, regularly or, or like every you know, six to eight hours after you've started Mobic. So we do this in the holding area. We also give those intraoperative blockades that have been studied you know, over a one to three day period. And then we continue it sort of while inpatient, we continue it and, and then they get discharged. And as it relates to penile implants, we do a lot of penile implants. And so I felt that you could compare those that get opioids to those that get this new protocol, but exclude a lot of people. Because in the penile implant world, a lot of people should get excluded. There are a lot of people that have, have concomitant, well, we do a lot of concomitant AUS maybe. We also have a lot of people that might have been on opioids at, at baseline already, or those that are already taking gabapentin, or those that are already taking um, um, something else, another agent like an NSAID. And so if you exclude those patients and try to do it very scientifically, you know, our, our uh, idea was to sort of compare. And what we found was dramatic reduction in VAS scores um, over just the quick follow-up. I mean, look right here in the opioid-based arm, the total morphine equivalent is roughly 25, whereas, you know, it's five, you know, on, on day one. But I'm no different than any other study if I don't have follow-up past that. So when you follow people past discharge, what we found was roughly 50% of people, despite writing a lot of narcotics, still needed a refill of their narcotics. Whereas when you don't write a lot of narcotics and you follow this kind of a pathway, we actually dramatically started to reduce not only the amount of breakthrough narcotics we send people home with, but it also decreased the number of refills. So now we're down to sending people home with five pills. We send people home with five pills of Percocet. We started at 20, we went to like 15, and that's why there's some variability in our narcotics discharge because we're trying to reduce the number that we're sending people home with. We're proud of it. You know, we think this is the first sort of recovery uh, pathway for pain that's been reported for penile implants. Patients do have less perceived pain and require fewer narcotics. Um, and for us, what we've done is, you know, we now have, and I said Martin Gross earlier, Martin Gross's team at Dartmouth, uh, there's a team at UC Irvine, and there's a team in Florida that have um, taken on to this study that we've presented. And we have now accrued a multi-institutional assessment, including our own series, a multi-institutional assessment, really looking at pain management in the penile implant cohort not only during the hospital stay, but throughout the entire delivery of their recovery period. Um, and we have pooled our data to be, to our knowledge, the only multi-institutional pain management study, not just in penile implants, but in urology ever done. And that is now getting presented and being written for manuscript right now. And um, it will be presented at the AUA. But it's as dramatic as our single institution sort of pilot series of reducing narcotics. Um, you know, something that uh, to me is just, again, sobering was that when we looked at opioids only administered in the penile implant cohort, I found unbeknownst to me that a quarter of patients that got a refill got a refill by a doctor, like the primary doctor, unbeknownst to me. And so another study that we have ongoing right now at our institution that um, is also getting presented at the AUA was to look at a series of patients throughout our institution managed by urology that underwent surgery. So it's roughly a thousand surgical cases. And we gave strict instructions and sort of documented all of this and, and so certainly told patients to follow up with us only for not only pain related issues, but also anything related to your surgery. And what we found was within 90 days of surgery, 
any prescription, we, we tracked all kinds of things, but uh, among the conversation is prescription refills. We found that greater than 50% of prescription refills in a 1,000 patient series was written by a non-urologist when actively being followed by a urologist. So as I see it, you know, the problem is, you know, we're trying to, I think as urologists, trying to, again, move the ball down the field and make things better for patients. But this is going to take some multidisciplinary work amongst the others, you know, that, that also care for our patients to get this to be better. Um, and, then, and then a final sort of thing that we're still working on um, is to, to look at risk factors for chronic opioid dependence that are surgery-based. You know that are based on sort of endo urology procedures. We have a stone guy who's really busy, and so he's he's sort of taking this on. Um, and then uh, I'm certainly doing it in my world of reconstruction and and implants. So you know, again, my hope is that you know this is something that I know a lot of people here might not have as high of a clinical interest in implants or recon uh, reconstruction. Um, but my hope is that pain management for urology does not need to necessarily be for IPPs. Hopefully, we've sort of I've tried to sort of allay this point that you know you could you could pre-medicate patients in the holding area with a multimodal strategy using Tylenol, NSAIDs, gabapentin, and that you know I'm not afraid to titrate up the gabapentin, and I liberally for for scrotal and penile cases use local. I use local anesthetics and a lot of them because um, I, I do find that it has it, it helps in their recovery, and then. Um, you know, I, I've, I've sort of taken it upon ourselves at our institution to recognize the dose-dependent risk of future narcotics dependence. Again, you know, I, I think I'm right on time. I want to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to try to give it a little bit of an uh, overview talk, but also some in-depth look of what we've done in my world. Um, um, but I certainly appreciate the opportunity to present here at Yale. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about this or anything else. Certainly, I can talk about UNC basketball, and I can talk about how Duke lost to Syracuse this, this past week. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Preoperative analgesia. Is there, is, you know, I find that and I've gotten a little away from local as I've gotten more towards meticulous no-touch technique, but I probably should get back to doing more local anesthesia. But um, is there any data looking at just giving it post-op or pre-op and post-op, either in the urological literature or elsewhere in orthopedics, neurosurgery, or otherwise? Yes. So in orthopedics, they have. Um, they have an orthopedic. Because I think that, that makes a big difference. In orthopedics, they have. And uh, again, the drivers here are similar to penile implants. It's their implants, hip replacement, you know, those kinds of things. And yes, in hip replacement, they've looked at this. And they have now created in orthopedics. Again, we're behind in urology. They've created um, sort of recommendations for orthopedics is that you pre-medicate for, for something like a hip replacement because it's been shown that the pain reduction is dramatic. Now, as it comes to no-touch technique and uh, uh, local anesthetics, I actually inject the local anesthetic at the, like right before prep. So, so before we prep the patient, we inject. And then, you know, it gives the medicine time to work. You know, we then prep the patient, we go scrub, and then you've, you've had several minutes of sort of a local to work. And you can, you know, I'm not a huge no-touch technique um, sort of advocate, meaning not an advocate or a, maybe a, a follower is what I would say. It, it works, I guess. Uh, but, but, um, but for you, you could still do it that way. And, and uh, I think you would have good results. There was another question I saw in the back. I have one from Dr. Moda Medinia. He oh, wants sure. to know, who are the non-urologists who wrote the narcotics for patients following, followed by urology? PCPs, ER physicians? Yes, so it's predominantly uh, PCPs. There's a component of it that's ER physicians, but the overwhelming component's PCPs. I mean, that's a charged abstract to write something like that, and I don't want this to be, you know, urologists, you know, uh, are fighting with the PCPs, and I don't want to create controversy in, in that kind of an abstract. But in our series, the, the overwhelming prescriber that was not a urologist was a PCP physician. Yeah. I saw a patient yesterday that had a, a constricted vagina, a lot of pain after uh, radiation therapy for rare your gynecologic cancer. And she was sexually active. So I asked her how she was, you know, actively having sex with all this pain. And she said, well, 
have a marijuana card. Like, you know, I didn't know <laughs> my interest. And I asked her, you know, tell me more. So <laughs> she was uh, taking, uh, I guess, THC suspended in oil, uh, taking it sublingually. She says, I take it like this and uh, I have no pain. I can have sex after with no problem. So um, in light of all this, you know, opioid, all these opioid problems, is there a future direction for this? Do you have any comments or thoughts about that? I mean, that's a good question. I, I don't know really where the future goes. I think where the future, I think unfortunately where the future is going is we have to catch up to laws that are being passed actively. That's the future. And so I think short term, what that means is, you know, we're going to either disseminate the information through like the AUA, by the way, has recognized this. So the AUA actually had a narcotics summit in DC. I don't know if anyone here went to that, but the AUA had a narcotics summit in DC maybe a month ago. Um, so I don't know what the future direction is other than to say that I think in urology, we have recognized, I think as an organization, that this is a significant problem. But I was out of the country, una unable to make that summit. And what I had heard from those that, you know, I'm good friends with Angie Smith, who helped run that, that, that summit. We were med school classmates. And Angie told me that really it was less about what we have done, and it's more about defining the problem, you know, and, and, and just trying to work towards creating a solution. So I, I think, I don't know where the future takes us, because I think we are, as a field, a little behind. So is there potentially a stigma against medical marijuana that limits its uses and potential, you know, uh, there might be, there, there certainly might be, it's just not with me, but, uh, but I think, you know, there might be uh, a limitation in using it in robust evidence, in a robust evidence-based fashion that would allow it to be studied with IRB approval, et cetera, et cetera, you know, but, but not necessarily with me, you know, not necessarily with me. Yeah, another, there's another question right here. Hi, that was a very nice talk. Thank you so much. Um, I find sometimes as a resident, it's challenging because after, especially maybe like uh, stone surgery, I'm sitting out with 10 pills of ditropan, 10 pills of peridium, 20 cent plus, five doses of Miralax, and then, you know, a small dose of narcotics. This isn't every patient, but just in general, trying to like minimize on the narcotics and you give them multimodal analgesic. And now if I add Tylenol, ibuprofen. Yeah. I always wonder what the cost is if I if it's better to give them thirty day supplies versus like just give them like ten pills if that costs like two bucks as opposed to six bucks. And then next thing you know, they're up to thirty dollars just walking out the door. Which you know your patients. So you only have to do this once. Yeah. Do you guys know the app GoodRx? Download GoodRx. GoodRx is a great app because you it's free, and um, I have no financial incentive with it. I, someone told me about it though. And, and basically, you just enter in your zip code, and you will see such discrepancies in how much drugs actually cost. It's amazing. So, so we've done that in our local area to figure out what costs what, and because we're not in charge of that, right? We're not driving cost in, in that sense. And um, you, I mean, you raise a good point. And as it relates to PCNL, um, my partner tells me that there was a randomized, and I don't know this for, but he's t told me that there was a randomized control trial looking at intercostal nerve blocks at the time of PCNL and opioid sort of need while in house. And what they found apparently was that six hours out after surgery, the opioid requirement was no different, that, they, that it didn't change. So he has adopted this technique of sort of injecting the tract and injecting the area of puncture site um, but I think some of what you're asking is PCNL based. Some of what you're asking though is your ureteroscopy as well, right? Yeah, I think your ureteroscopy is hard. I think uh, the stone patients. Um, the only thing I can say for stone is what we've done is pre-medicate. Try if it's a, a percutaneous case, then it's sort of local infiltration, and then continue what you're pre-medicating with. How about colic yeah. though? I mean, do you have a protocol for colic? Do similar I have a protocol for colic? Do we have a protocol for colic? Do you have colic? a protocol for colic? Yeah. Similar to non-narcotic that you've set out for the penile implants. I rely on my stone guy for it. The protocol he has, you know, sort of uh, done for our group is, you said it, those things. Ditropan bowel regimen. Ditropan, ditropan or extended release ditropan, Vesicare, those kinds of drugs, and uh, bowel regimen. Those are, those are our protocols for it. 
No, we have not done gab for 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 colic for specifically. We have not done gab pension. Sorry, we've done toradol as well. We have done toradol, certainly. Yes, we've done toradol. Yeah, um, I'm Ryan. I'm one of the uh, urology inpatient PAs, and uh, I think I speak on behalf of a lot of the inpatient PAs who take care of our bigger surgeries, the conduits, nephrectomies, prostatectomies. You know, we deal with a lot of pain calls from nurses and then you know we do the bulk majority of the discharging but there's never really been anything set up for us to how much to give the oxycodone when they leave and we don't do clinic and so we don't see these people right so i don't know if i'm giving them enough to just make it through the follow-up in a week or if they're still having pain so you know we just kind of blind play it by ear and yeah play it by ear exactly but, but i think that's why i like that oriole study because I think it really shows that, at least in the Baltimore area, when they were prescribing medicines, it really, it really shed light on the idea that you prob we probably don't need to. And, and I certainly understand the phone call part of it. I lived that, you know, <laughs> lived getting the phone call as the resident. Um, but I, I think maybe since, since the regulation is coming to limit narcotics, not imposed by urology, but imposed by government, I think we have to try to understand this before it's mandated to us. Dr. I, I have a question. So how many in this room, especially the attendings, have alternative protocols for opiate use? Alternative protocols that do not rely on opioid, post-op, for pain. Is, how, the, the residents, the attendings, is anyone? It's interesting because, so when I was at UCLA, we switched to Toradol and really minimized the post-operative use. When I came here, I convinced them to do that, but then they went one step further. So all our donors now get a tap block. Yeah. One hour before surgery and the uh, pre, you know, before they go back, and then we put them on Toradol postoperatively, and they go on go home on Ultram, zero narcotics, during the stay and postoperatively, and it's amazing. Yes. So we we've done the tap block certainly for major abdominal surgery. Tap block. We do that routinely. Um, you know, and that's part of this. You know, the locals and the regionals. You need sort of, you need, and, and the tap block isn't to us, right? That's anesthesia. At least maybe you're doing it, Dr. Shulam, but, but for us, the anesthesiologist. No, no, we're, no, the anesthesiologist, yeah, yeah. Do it, they, you know, they come in, they get the tap block. So every donor gets a tap block. Right. I'm just surprised that we don't, we're not thinking like that as a department. Um, go ahead. Are we or are we not? I got a $600 bill after my wife's C-section for a tap block. <laughs> I, I'm, being, I'm being dead serious. I like. But they came in being like, oh, it's going to be great. It's gonna, I, I just kind of stayed out. I'm like, yeah, it's fine. Like, whatever she wants. And then I literally got that bill, and I was like, well, that's not cool. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Intraoperative toward all, I think that, and they found that there was less postoperative opiate use. It's an abstract that's being presented to AUA. I, I think that uh, Jamil and Matt were on that paper if they want to speak more about that. Toradol versus no Toradol intraoperatively given before uh, induction or at induction and seeing postoperative pain. And so far, uh, not intraoperative narcotic requirement, but postoperative narcotic requirement in the PACU in recovery. So it's not very long term, it's just in recovery, uh, is decreased with giving the, uh, the Toradol. And we're, we're about halfway through our accrual for that. When I was doing a lot of stone work, all, every patient um, at UCLA prior to leaving the OR for uteroscopy received 30 milligrams of Toradol. So at our institution, um, you know, I guess this is more of a systemic issue for us. We, we I think uh, this, this type of work took traction in our organization. And so very recently, actually, I was looking at emails about this on my way here. Now it is mandated across all surgical disciplines for all routine operations that they have a multimodal analgesia pathway. And every surgeon has been mandated to create a pathway, run it by their chairman, and then submit it to IT for a power for what we call power plan, like a like medication plan, so that you can put an order in. So that is now system wide at our at our organization. Mm -hmm. I trained in with um, with Dr. Valenzuela. Mm, yeah, he actually did a similar local block. He did 40 cc's combination of ropivacaine, lidocaine with dexamethasone. Yes, sodium bicarb. He did not send patients home with any narcotic requirement at all. Yeah, I know. And the yeah. vast majority didn't end up needing any. He sent yeah, them with so, ultra. So Bob Valenzuela and I, we're, we're good friends. And Bob Valenzuela comes up to me and he's like, Jay, you stole my idea. 
And I'm like, what do you mean I stole your idea? He's like, well, I've been doing this for like eight years or nine years or something. And I was like, well, the problem though, this is what I said to Bob jokingly. You know, I was like, I'm like, the problem though, Bob, is what we've tried to shed light on is they're not necessarily following up with us to get narcotics. And there's a sizable population of patients, if you look at the grand total, that are getting narcotics from another source. And so while I appreciated the Valenzuela assessment, what I told him was, you know, we, we're trying to reduce this for their entire delivery of care, and he just doesn't have the follow-up, you know? And, and so, no, but it's a good point. Well made. There's another, there's another, oh, two, yeah. Um, just quickly, just to Dr. Shulam's point, um, actually, we do have um, a multimodal uh, analgesia pro, uh, protocol here. It just hasn't been 100% standardized. So the vast majority of our patients are getting tap blocks. They are, or they are getting um, uh, epidurals, et cetera. Um, they are getting preoperative gabapentin and Tylenol um, uh, before, before their procedures. Um, however, where I think where we're losing a lot of it is in the postoperative care. Yeah. And so everyone's getting, pretty much everyone's getting gabapentin who's having a major surgery preoperatively. Postoperatively, I think there's a lot of um, maybe concern from the attendings. Um, some are liberal and very, you know, interested in kind of trying these things out. Some are less. Um, I think we uh, we had one notable ex uh, example where a patient um, became so um, uh, sensitized postoperatively, she actually had um, had was concerned about um, uh, um, airway protection um, about six hours after surgery and had a um, uh, anesthesia called. They pushed Narcan. So you kind of just they kind of walked her through this time period, and they re they looked back at her narcotic requirements, and she had had points two of dilated eight hours before this airway issue, and the only thing they could describe it as was the gabapentin. Right. Um, and, and, and so I mean, there, there's some still some fear, some figuring it out, um, yeah. but we do have those protocols in place. Um, so just in defense of our institution. No, 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 uh, no, no. It's not about that. It was more. No, no, please, no, no need to, no need to say that. And there's one. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm a PA here, and I, I spent um, many years in the emergency department before coming to this department. Um, the, uh, obviously, the stone patients that come in uh, will not leave without narcotics, and then there's the post-op patients. Just to remind everyone, the folks in the ED um, are, are really uh, making an effort to prescribe less narcotics to the community. Um, we've seen folks like selling their bottles outside Walgreens, uh, frankly. But there's an FYI bar, so if you have a protocol that you want to try to instate with the patient population or if, the, if anyone's working on a study, the FYI bar in EPIC is uh, definitely noted by ED attendings, uh, and if you write a very concise note about your pain plan, they will follow it, and if they have any questions, they'll call to ask. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah, Dr. Singh. My wife is a psychiatrist, and she has been board certified to take medicines that she does. Um, and I use a lot of tramadol. And I think that tramadol is not often even thought of. It's not prescribed because you don't even think about it. It's a good medicine. People who really want narcotics to stay, but of course, we get them before they really are in desire for narcotics. Right. I, I've been told that tramadol is soon to be as regulated, though, as Percocet. Yeah, and, right. No, but I agree with you that it's, it works. You know, I agree with you, certainly. All right, thank you. Please. Thank you.